I want to go into a fair bit of detail about the Atkinson Schifrin model. So therefore I'm actually going to do four clips, one on sensory memory, one on SDM, one on LTM and one brief overview which includes the strengths and weaknesses of the Atkinson Schifrin model. So if you check out my YouTube channel, Psych Counting, as of about mid-May 2012, you'll find my other YouTube clips on STM, LTM and the overview, like I said. So sensory memory registers input from the environment. We must pay attention for it in order for it to go to STM. And then, of course, we must rehearse it elaboratively, ideally, to store it in LTM. Interestingly, some information can bypass SDM, particularly visual, and go directly to LTM. So in order for a memory trace to be formed, it must be registered by the sensory memory, which can hold vast quantities of information in its raw and unprocessed form. So sensory memory has a buffering-like function in that it can hold information just long enough for us to determine whether to attend to it or not. If, of course, we don't attend to information registered in our sensory memory, the memory trace will never, in fact, form and we, it will rapidly decay. So we do have different sensory registers and we're going to focus on iconic and echoic memory. So our iconic memory can store an unlimited quantity of visual information for about a third of a second, which explains why we can fixate on an image and then look elsewhere, maybe into the sun, and we get an after image. It's also relevant in understanding change blindness. Here's an illustration of iconic memory. We're storing a visual image of the previous page for just long enough to create the illusion of movement with the overlapping memory of the subsequent page and so on. Iconic memory also helps explain how we're able to maintain visual continuity after isocades and isocades are quick jerky eye movements that occur without notice when our eyes scan small elements of our visual field which enables us to maintain a high resolution image. Now I want to talk about Sperling's iconic memory experiments. So there are a couple of variations of Sperling's experiments on the duration of iconic memory where using a tachistoscope he briefly flashed a series of letters for 50 milliseconds or five hundredths of a second which was not long enough for the viewer to actually vocalise them reading across the rows etc putting them into the awareness. So just long enough for the iconic memory to register the visual image. After the 50 milliseconds exposure time, a blank screen was exposed. And in the case of experiments where the viewer was required to report all of the letters, most subjects could only get between three and five letters, and on average about 35% of the actual letters. Now what happened here was, was that the subjects, as they reported the P, Y, F, G, V, etc., these other letters rapidly faded from memory. They weren't actually attended to. Now a variation on the whole report experiment was a partial report experiment where again subjects were exposed to three rows of letters and then randomly either a high tone was sounded, which required subjects to identify the top row, a medium tone for the middle row, a low tone for the bottom row. If the tone was sounded immediately after the exposure of the letters, subjects fared much better under these conditions, averaging a recall rate of about 75% of the letters of the row in question. But the more the tone was delayed, the lower the recall rate. And once we got to about the one second mark, there was pretty much no difference in the recall rate of an individual row versus the entire image, around 35%, like I talked about on the previous slide. So Miller concluded that iconic memory has a duration of about 0.5 to one second. A 
Coic memory stores a unlimited volume of auditory information for three to four seconds. A distinguishing feature of a Coic memory as opposed to iconic memory is we can't replay the sound that we register in a mind as opposed to an iconic image that we can rescan, providing it's still in view, a number of times, which is what we frequently do when we are reading left to right. So sounds resonate or echo in our mind until another sound replaces it, as demonstrated with some of those musical sounds that I replayed on the previous slide. So the three to four second duration of echoic memory is functional in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's long enough to enable us to string together the sounds of syllables of words together to make sense not only of individual words but of the speech of others. Secondly, the duration is short enough to have a filtering effect by rapidly fading words once we've held on to them for long enough to basically make sense of subsequent words so that we don't get this excessive overlapping of words becoming jumbled in our mind and creating literally confusion in, in the form of brain overload.